What I want to do today is to discuss some of the strategy that's to be used in, uh, in predicate logic. For the most part, it's the same uh, as in sentence logic. But of course, we've got some new rules, and so there's some new moves and new, new strategies for those new moves uh, that I want to go over. But first, let's review um, what we said before. And these simply repeat the SL strategic principles uh, by replacing P SD with PD, where PD is uh, predicate uh, derivations as opposed to sentence derivations. The very first thing uh, to think about is to look at the goal. Look at the thing that you're trying to prove. That will give you an immense head start if you can see what you're trying to do. Uh, quite generally, uh, you'll be given an ultimate goal, that is, what you're supposed to do. Either show that something's inconsistent, or that it's a logical fallacy, or a particular formula you're supposed to show is a, a logical truth. That means to derive it without any premises. But it will have a cer certain characteristics. And in particular, look at the main connective. It doesn't say that here. But the main thing to think about is the main connective. The word connective can be a little bit misleading. I mean, the first thing we think about with connectives are the first ones we got, like ampersand, and wedge, and horseshoe, and triple bar. Those are certainly connectives. They connect two sides of an equation, if you like, or a formula. So they're connectives. But we now have quantifiers, and they are, and, and oh, another one that's not, that's on the, on the borderline was tilde. Not. That's also called a connective, even though it doesn't connect anything. It just negates whatever it controls. So that's the first one that isn't exactly a connective in the, in the normal English sense. And these quantifiers, too, are called connectives in our technical jargon. Even though they don't seem to connect anything, they just tell you how a sentence is to be quantified. So. In, you know, so the connectives, ampersand, or, horseshoe, equivalence, tilde, upside down A, backwards E, all of those things are candidates for the main connective. And you want to look at the main connective in your ultimate goal. Whatever it is you're trying to derive, what's the main connective? That's going to be the most important clue about how to proceed in your derivation. If the main connective as in sentence logic, it often was, and will still be sometimes in our predicate logic derivations if the main connective is a horseshoe. What technique would you be inclined to use? Horseshoe elimination? Horseshoe introduction. If what you want to get has as its main connective the horseshoe, best thing to do is to plan on using horseshoe introduction and assume the antecedent. See if you can deduce the consequent. If you can do that, horseshoe introduction allows you to put into your derivation the very thing you're trying to prove. So that's the clue. What if you want to? Uh, uh, derive a something that's universally quantified. The main connective is the universal quantifier, upside down A. Well, similarly here, what you'd want to, I mean, we're, if, you, if you're trying to get something with a horseshoe, you're going to use horseshoe introduction. Similarly here, if what you want to get, if the last line in the proof is supposed to be a universally quantified statement, a single universally quantified statement, and, that, and the universal quantifier is the main connective, then you want to use universal introduction again. So look at the ultimate goal carefully, especially look at the main con connective. And then as you're moving down through the derivation, uh, you may well determine some intermediate goals that, that you need to, 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 to seek out. And sometimes that will call for 
yet another subderivation. So that's the first part of our strategy. Now, this is another part of the strategy that's made explicit. You can, all, you can find these, by the way, both in the reference guides to chapters 5 and 8, chapter 5 for sentence logic, chapter 8 for predicate logic. And in each case, they explicitly say this thing that you might think, well, that's weird. Why would they have to say something about doing what's obvious? <laughs> do what's obvious. OK, <laughs> but I was going to do what's obvious anyway. So it might not occur to you as a very helpful hint to do what's obvious. That's not why it's in there explicitly. It's in there explicitly because of the proviso, which tells you don't always just do what's obvious. The proviso says do what's obvious if that clearly moves you toward your goal. Um, both in the quizzes I get back and the, and the work that I see uh, that students do on the Logic Cafe, it's pretty evident that um, you know, sometimes you, you just get into a place where you're kind of uh, just trying anything. And sometimes you've got to do that. But the must, much better situation is if you hold off on just sort of doing any old thing that is obvious. Like if you see a universally quantified statement, oh, I'll just uh, instantiate. I'll bring that out. Sometimes that leads you in the wrong direction. And sometimes the cafe uh, exercises are actually set up so as to sort of you know, make it inviting to go off in that wrong direction. The point of such exercises is not just to make you mad. The point of such exercises is to get you to be thinking about where you're going. I just suddenly think about conversations I'm having with my son right now. Never forget about that. <laughs> think about where you're going, what you want to do, and what are some reasonable means to get there. This is good advice for life. <laughs> but in, in the case of logic, it's not so important to remember to do what's obvious. You'll always remember to do what's obvious. The important thing is watch out. Do what's obvious to you if that clearly helps you toward your goals. Don't just take every inviting thing. Like don't just pull out every damn thing out of a, a, a conjunction and list that. And then take, you know, do every other thing you can possibly do. You know, if you're absolutely without any clue as to where to go, try stuff. But um, generally speaking, you know, tr hold out. Try to, try to figure out where you're going and what you're supposed to be doing in the problem. Um, this is what I said a moment ago. And in considering both the introduction and the elimination rules, uh, especially when thinking about the introduction rules, think about the main connective of the goal sentence. And then, second clause, consider the elimination rules that are appropriate for the main connectives of any accessible sentences uh, that you might have already derived. That includes assumptions. And, and so what are accessible sentences? That's the ones that are either above you in your whatever current derivation or subderivation you're in, that are either above you in, 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 in the, the column that you're working in, in the logic cafe, or are in a column to the left of your, your column. Those are all accessible, above you and either directly above you or in some column to your left. All of those lines are accessible. So the elimination rules are helpful uh, for the main connectives of any of the accessible sentences that you may have already derived. OK. Any questions about uh, these particular uh, strategic recommendations? And then uh, recycle. After you've done this, uh, you can just go back through the strategic suggestions and, and try them again. And then finally, in one of the 
circumstances that I envisioned a moment ago. Ah. After you apply the rule, just recycle. And once again, these are all available in the reference guide to chapter 8. They're also available in the reference guide to chapter 5 because these strategic recommendations are uh, good advice both for SD and PD, both for sentence derivations and for predicate derivations. Any other time I go too fast, please do what Steve just did and stop me and say, go back. Now, finally, for the more difficult derivations, it may be best to wait to apply the tilde elimination until other means are attempted. In other words, that one is, um, you know, reserve that for last. In other words, assuming the opposite of what you're trying to prove. I mean, it might be um, a strategy that recommends itself to you is obvious. This might be one of the things that seem obvious. Well, I can prove anything if I can assume the opposite of what I want to uh, want to derive and then show that that leads to a contradiction. Well, yes, you can, but it might take you 57,000 lines of, of derivation to do that, whereas there might be another way that would be much quicker, more elegant, more efficient. So the suggestion is to try, try everything else first, and then if all else fails, then think about uh, not elimination, tilde elimination. And then uh, bits of advice are when an accessible line has tilde as its main connective, you may want to reiterate that statement in order to provide the contradiction. In other words, in your subderivation, you prove A. You may have already had curl A in uh, an earlier line of the derivation, and you could now reiterate that to show that whatever the assumption was leads to a contradiction. And then, as I say, when all else fails, uh, you might have to assume the negation of your goal and work toward a contradiction. Now, those are the strategic uh, recommendations that we got also for Chapter 5. Um, but you got some new ones because we got both universal introduction and we have existential elimination, two new uh, uh, connectives to work with, and so there's two new bits of strategy. The first one is when a goal has the universal um, connective as its, main, as its main one, you first try to prove the appropriate substitution instance as a preliminary goal. What I want to do is, we'll come, we'll, I'll leave that on the screen because the best thing for us to do is to try an example. Okay. Um, let's do what I suggested. Let's start from the bottom. What we're supposed to derive here, as usual, is this thing. And it's got question marks on it indicating, as usual, that we haven't got it yet, but that's where we're trying to go. We're, what our, the whole objective is to try and show that if these are our premises, we should be able to get to this. And this is one of those cases where the goal has the universal quantifier as its main connective all x, mx, horseshoe tx. It says that for everything in our uh, universe of discourse, if it's m, then it's t. Now, since the univer universal quantifier is the main connective, that suggests that the, uh, that the particular um, rule that we want is universal introduction, and it'll be on something or other that we've got in line 8. So I'm going to ask you, my first question is, what kind of thing should we look for in line 8, or should we be seeking, this is a sub-goal now, what kind of thing should we be trying to achieve by line 8 so that we can then use universal introduction on it to get that? This is reasoning backwards. Anybody? So what did you say, MA? Good. Should that be for all y and line two? Why? Because otherwise you can't have a done statement. 
M A horse or T A? No, for mine too. Yeah, it should be. Thank you. It's a dumb statement without the Y. Thank you. Keep reminding me when I advertise dumb things because I got to know that. All right. So, but this is correct. What we're trying to get, what we want to try and figure out is how to get down to MA horseshoe TA so that then we can use a universal introduction on that line to get that. Okay. All right. Now let's do the rest of the derivation. What uh, sort of a derivation should this be? What should we do in line three? Let's go back up to the top. So we now have a direction, and I think there's a technique that invites itself. Horseshoe introduction sounds like a good one, so that sounds like the what we're going to try and use as a rule. Uh, could, you use a separate could I do what? Oh, I, yes, I can. I, you, you've been messing with yours, right? Okay. Okay, now you can go back to yours and I'll scribble in on mine. Okay. Okay, so that sounds like the rule that we should use. And Alex, could you suggest what we should do at line three? Okay, uh, so Alex suggested go ahead and, and, and eliminating the, um, uh, the universal quantifier around which one? Which, which premise are you working on? Uh, on number one. Um, that's not what I recommend. And since we're focusing on strategy this session, I want to suggest to you that, look, if you know what your, your goal is, your goal is to try and achieve MA horseshoe TA. Down there in line eight, that's what you, or whatever the line will be. We don't know how many lines we're going to have to use here, but that's what we want to get at. How do we do that? If, especially if we, we envision using horseshoe introduction. Someone offer a suggestion as to what the line, uh, that what to do in line three that that exploits the thing that we want to do uh, get to that utilizes the strategy. Look for the goal, figure out what's the best way to get there. Sure. So what, basically what we're saying here is, all right, these are the things that we're given. And now we're saying, all right, look, let's just say MA were true. Let's just, just, for the sake of the argument, what if MA were, were the case? We're not committed to that. It's in a subderivation. We're just assuming this for the moment. We're going to have to discharge that assumption, right? We can't use anything in here permanently, and so, except insofar as we're allowed to pull it back into the main derivation by one of the derivation rules. So let's assume MA. Jeff. In, in this case? No, not in this case, but let's say you had to do more than one subdivision. Yeah. You're just wasting lines because you've got to re-pull out that rule each time. That, you, you, you met, if you foresee that, then yes. Try, try to, you know, an elegant proof is the one that, that uh, reduces the number of steps, reduces the number of lines. And it may be that uh, your intuitions will tell you, look, I'm going to have to use this more than once. If I, uh, and what I want to do is to just pull it out all together. And, and, and so as your intuitions guide you, as if you look at these things over and you say, I want to have this at, at my disposal for several possible subderivations, and I don't want to have to keep unpacking it again for every single one. That's your point, right? I'll do it once now, and it'll be there. Fine. What, what I'm trying to explore, though, are some of these strategic suggestions. 
And I want to show you how powerful they are because they can actually, while they might not always give you the most elegant and shortest derivation, uh, they are pretty unfailing as in, in guiding your intuitions about how to proceed. And that's, I think, where people get stuck more than anything else. They say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. And so that's what we're, we're focusing on today is strategy and not necessarily elegance. As one gets really uh, up to speed with, uh, with, with basic strategies, I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes you'll, you'll say, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do it this kind of conventional way. I want to take this out so that I don't have to unpack it two, three different times uh, later. Okay? As it happens with this particular derivation, it's simple enough that we're not going to need to do that. So I want to focus on the idea that since we're fo trying to get to line 8, let's immediately go to the technique that's going to allow us to use universal um, uh, I'm sorry, um, horseshoe introduction on something in line 7 to get there. And uh, that means assuming MA. Where do we go then? What's the next line, somebody? If we've assumed MA in, in line 3, what will we do in line 4? Sure, on what? And that gives us? And indeed, we choose A, because we want to make use of um, the horseshoe elimination in, with these two. If we've got MA, and we know that MA implies BAC, then we can use on the next line uh, from 3 and 4 by horseshoe elimination, that gives us BAC, right? OK, now what? Somebody else. These are all standard. This stuff isn't new stuff now. Yep. And that we're going to once again choose our variables. It's a universal quantifier. This says, line 2 says, for all x, or y. I should, didn't change it on that one, did I? For all y, ty is equivalent to byc. So I can choose any variable I want. If that's the case, then what, what can I write down on line 5? I can, I can, or on line 6, I can li write down. T A B A C. Then what's in line seven? Triple bar Say what? Triple bar yep. On line six, that gives us. Uh, I'm sorry. On uh, five and six, gives us T A because we have. BAC, we know that TA is equivalent to BAC, so those two things together allows us to pull out the TA. And now, how do I write this? The, uh, the justification for the move from line 7 to line 8. Brandon. The num numbers I'm looking for. I'm, no, this is this is horseshoe introduction. Oh, oh, uh, three through seven. Three through seven, right? Three through seven horseshoe introduction, M A horseshoe T A. Why is this justified? Well, once again, the intuition is this: we've just assumed M A. We said, given that this is true, we're assuming M A. But we found out that if we assume M A, we're able to derive T A. So that this is all very conditional. If M A then TA. Well, but that's what this says, MA horseshoe TA. So that with these premises, we are inclined to conclude this conditional, if MA, then TA. And then that's all we need to do because we were working, we got that line by working backwards. Now, using all the uh, universal introduction on 8, we get all X, MX, horseshoe TX. That allows us to get rid of those question marks. Why are we enabled? I mean, we just assumed this thing. How come we're allowed to go from 
MA Horseshoe TA to all X MX Horseshoe TX. I mean, this says, it goes from, oh, well, A, it's true about A, to saying it's true about everything. What in the world makes that legitimate? How can we do that? Alex. Right, and the, and the way I would put that, the way I would put that uh, is this. Where did we get this single name here, A? Well, we got it because it's an instance, we, we assumed it, but then all of these other things, all we were using were, uh, was information about things that are true of everything. So A became only an example. A was one of the things that this is true of. It's arbitrary. It's a completely arbitrary choice of letter. We didn't have any reason to think any particular things about A. It was just supposed to be representative as we worked through these universal um, eliminations, representative of these formulae, which said that, first of all, for all X, MX, Horseshoe, BXC, and all Y, TY equivalent to BYC, those are true of everything. And that's the only information we've been using. So now we can discharge that. Say, well, this was, this was just a, an arbitrary example of stuff that's true of everything. So we're entitled to put that universal quantifier back on. No special assumptions were being made about A. A was just an arbitrary example of things that were universally true. Is that clear? Because that causes trouble, and it's going it's to similarly cause trouble with existential elimination when we get there. We're trying to figure out, why am I justified in doing this? And you'll have these, uh, these, these uh, trials of conscience that will come over you sometimes when you're trying to do these things. And, and occasionally, I, I suspect, it may even say, I'm just, I'm just following rules here. I don't see why this works. Uh, your objective as always, is to get to a place not where you're just following rules because it says so in the cafe or because Sanders told you to do it. You got to get to a place where you're feeling them. You're saying, oh yes, I see why this must be right. And that's the goal, always. That's why I'm so concerned when, we ha when, when you raise questions, uh, whether it's about a quiz uh, question or something else, and I can't clearly ex explain why this one's right and that one's wrong. I'm uncomfortable. And you should be too. If you can't clearly see why one thing is right and one thing is wrong, then you, you haven't quite got it yet. And I haven't quite got it yet. And you have to keep working. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, when sentence logic, we were able to resort to truth tables. Now we can't do that anymore with these quantifiers. What we have to do is to, is to resort to, to derivations. And uh, if you need to, uh, it, it, and if you can, uh, demonstrate that two things are equivalent, that will help your intuitions. You'll be satisfied then, I think. So any questions about this stuff? <coughs> okay. All right. The strategy for existential elimination. And again, here are the words, and we will go uh, through some examples. Again, when an accessible sentence, that is, a sentence, let's say we're working over here, any, from here, these are accessible and these are accessible, right? From here, these are no longer accessible because you've discharged that entire assumption. You were just making that assumption for a moment to, in order to get this so that you could conclude this. Now, if your pr proof were to go further down, the only accessible sentences would be the ones up here. In general, if you've got 18,000 different subderivations going over here, anything in your column or above you in any of the columns to the left of where you're working, all of those, all of those lines are accessible until you discharge the various uh, assumptions that you're making. But when an accessible sentence contains a sentence with the existential quantifier as its main connective, you can often make progress by first making an assumption, in other words, starting a new subderivation, 
which is an appropriate substitution instance, where by appropriate I mean an illustration. When you have a line that says, as, as we'll see, uh, exists x, b x, it says that's telling you, well, there's something in the universe of discourse, there's something that has the characteristic b, the quality b, the property b, something does. And you don't know what it is. There's, you know, maybe an infinite number of things in the university of Dis universe of discourse. Not the university of discourse. That's in Montana. But the universe of discourse. Uh, you may, there may be, you know, any number of things there. Um, so you don't know which one we're talking about. So what are you going to do? Well, you have to say something like, "All right, it says that something has the property B. Let's just say that M does." You know, just sort of as an illustration. Something has it. Let's give it a name so we can work with it, for heaven's sakes. So that's the point of, uh, the, of, the, of the strategy for existential elimination. You make an assumption, which is an appropriate substitution instance. That is, one that hasn't been mentioned before. That's a nice, short way of putting this. If you've mentioned a particular name before, it's probably not an appropriate substitution instance when you're trying to use existential elimination. Why? Well, because you already know about that particular thing. You don't know if this particular thing is the one that has property B. And then working toward your goal, whether it's a preliminary goal or an ultimate one, will require using the other kinds of techniques that we've, we've got at our disposal. But let's go, those are the words, and once again, you can find them uh, in print and online, in the Logic Cafe, in the reference guide for chapter 8. So you don't need to have to write all this stuff down. Um, so let's go to, find the right one. This, to, and uh, enjoy, enjoy the music in the background, as usual. All right, let's look at this before we get started. Before you write anything, please, wait, uh, and then, then I'll turn you loose. Before you write anything, there's all kinds of things that you could do with this. This will be one of those cases where we'll want to use existen existential elimination, our new rule. It's easy to see by using the new rules that you've gotten within the last week. There's all kinds of things that you can now do with this. Um, for example, you can start with one using I M, and you can say exists Y curl A Y or L, M, M, I don't have enough room to write in. And then on that line, you could, um, oh, use, I guess, two double negation. That would give you E, Y, uh, curl A, Y, or curl, curl, L, M, M. And then that would, that, that's a, a way of going to, um, Using De Morgan, exists Y curl, A Y ampersand um, curl L M M, right? And then now we've got that. We could go from four by quantifier negation, and we can go. That gives us this. all using things that it might appear obvious to do. But where has it gotten us? Nowhere! <laughs> I mean, what are we going to do with that? Now, there might be some circumstances in which it's useful to have that. But we've just added four more lines to the derivation without getting appreciably closer to the goal. So one reason for being very careful to pay attention to that proviso I mentioned because, you know, there's all kinds of things that might appear obvious. And you should use obvious tricks when you don't see anything else to do. But always keep your eye on the goal. I want to get down there. What kind of thing does it look like I might want to use down there in order to get to that? Yes, horseshoe introduction. Horseshoe introduction is, 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 a, is something we'll use in the proof. But let me uh, suggest to you that uh, right now uh, we'll try and get this, well, you try and use that out here, okay? But what we want to do is to do uh, an existential elimination on that, and we'll, uh, we'll follow your advice in a subderivation. 
So let's work with the existential uh, elimination principles. What it suggests that you do, and this is something that's always true of existential elimination. And the last line, what it does is simply pulls bodily whatever you had in the previous line, pulls it back from its subderivation into the derivation, into the derivation proper. Okay? So what first one of the things that might sort of throw you at first is that look, this line isn't any different than this line. Except well this one's got question marks, but that doesn't count. Um, so existential elimination always simply pulls bodily the, the particular line that you've managed to establish here, and it's that one that we'll get using horseshoe elimination, pulls it over here. Now how does it do that? Well, um, it begins at the top, and this is also always, if you've got an existential premise that you're working for, or a line elsewhere, it might not be a premise, it might be some line earlier in the derivation, or it might be a line in a subderivation. but if you've got a line above you, one that's accessible, that is, one that you can work with, if it's, if it's main connective as an existential quantifier, well, what you can do in a subderivation, you always have to come one column to the right to do this, what you can do is simply take use a proper substitution instance of it. That is, use a name that's different than any other name that's been used before from the domain. So this says something has the characteristic that if it's a y, if it's a, then no mention of a, then lmn. So here what we do is assume a a horseshoe lmm, which simply means Look, this says something has this characteristic. Let's just work with A. That's the one we're going to work with. Let's let A be the thing that has the property of if it's got capital A, then LMM. OK, there's that. We start with that. And then we um, ask ourselves, how are we going to get to this conclusion? And we already have the answer. Uh, this looks like we want to use a horseshoe introduction. And that would suggest that uh, we do this. OK. Now let's, let's proceed from there. I'm still wanting to, so we're going to assume this. Okay, so we assume this here, and now we're assuming that under these circumstances. What, what should I do next? K, do you see what I should do? No. Okay, Alex? Can't do that. Why can't I do that? Why can't I do two and three horseshoe elimination? Did you, are you telling me, Jamie? I can't hear you. Yeah, it doesn't because, because the antecedent of two isn't three. But it's, it's one step away from that, Alex. You're not wrong about the general concept, Trent. Can we do one uh, existential, the existential elimination? You don't need to do that. And that's, that, that's by the way, is what we're going to wind up doing in line seven. But I've got all x a x in line three. What will that allow me to do in line four? Tiff Melissa. Yeah, by universal elimination on line three, I can say a a, and then what? Okay, so horseshoe elimination using lines four and two, right? And that gives us L, M, M, which is what I was trying to get to, because what I wanted in line six was this particular implication. What I wanted in line six was all X, A, X, horseshoe L, M, M. Toward that end, I assumed all X, A, X, and now I've derived L, M, M. 
So I can say that from three through five, by horseshoe introduction, I've got what I wanted there. And that's finally what allows me to draw my conclusion. Because how did I get to line six? Well, it was by assuming in line two, AA horseshoe LMM, which was just a, a, an arbitrary, illustrative instantiation of the premise, the thing I was given, premise one. Uh, I was given that, I said, all right, let's just use A as our example. I showed that using that as an example, it could have been any of the things that, uh, that line one is true of. I derived this, A, 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 X, uh, um, all X, A, X, horseshoe, L, M, M. So I'm allowed from one, and this is the way to write this down. You put one, that is the, that's the existential premise or the existential, uh, existentially quantified statement that we've used EE -E on. We've eliminated its quantifier in favor of the assumption in line two. And then the actual derivation went on from two through six. So that's the way you write this. You, you first of all point to the, the existential, the existentially quantified statement you've been working on comma, then you uh, mention where exactly what the lines were of the subderivation. It's two through six existential elimination. All right, let's look at that carefully. This is just a, by way of a walkthrough. Uh, do you see how that works? The two things I want you to focus especially on are these. Existential elimination always concludes by simply repeating the last line of the subderivation. Okay? Always. That's the way it works. And it always begins by a, a, a particular instantiation of the, an existential statement. The existential statement has to be one that controls the entire line. You can't use this method on a line that has an existential quantifier someplace within it. And then you want a particular substitution instance of it that isn't prejudice that doesn't talk about, doesn't use a variable that you've used before. Because all this does is it tells you that there's, there's something in the universe of discourse that this is true about. And you're saying, call it a, I don't know what it is, just call it a for a minute. We won't depend on this. And so that's how this proceeds. And then finally, this is always the way that you cite the, the lines for existential elimination. You cite the line of the existentially quantified statement you've been working on, comma, and then the lines of the subderivation connected by a dash. All right. Let us work through some other ones. Okay, what I'd like you to do is work on this. This should illustrate uh, universal introduction. These are pretty easy ones as they go, but since they're new techniques, they might cause you some difficulty.
Okay, um, let's, <laughs> there is a one-step method for solving this problem. How many found the one-step method for solving this? Okay, let's go to the not one-step method and see what others have done. Just because I want to exercise the technique, and then we'll come back to the one-step method. All right, Alex. Go ahead. Don't have to. Just three. Okay, three. Um, universal induction, upside down AX, DX or A. Right, and I just scribbled all over you. I'm sorry, I forgot, all, I forgot about that. Okay, so that's the one, that's the, uh, the four step, three step solution. There's three extra steps required. Okay. And f as for the one step method, Alex also? I is just one commutation. All right. I almost did what you often do. I almost left off that first parenthesis, which would, if I'd left it like that, if I'd left it, uh, if I left it like that, that's just not a formula of predicate logic. It's, uh, it leaves a, uh, a variable unquantified over. So that's not a proper formula. All right, let's try, I wish I could see those things better. It's 10. Let's try this. On this one, show that all y be y. Uh, Kimberly, what, what should I do with uh, the, uh, line two? Um, I did one uh, upside down AE. And then I got AY and BY. Okay, Y is not right. Because what you want is now a name, and Y is another variable. Every, all of the lowercase letters after V, W, X, Y, and Z, all of those are variables, and what you want is a name, because we're trying to find an instance, uh, you know, substitution instance for that formula, and what qualifies are the lowercase le letters up through U. So choose another one. A, A, is one there. Yeah. So Much abused ones. By the way, I noticed some folks on the quiz um, we're getting tired of using X's and Y's all the time and began to try to use other, other lowercase letters as variables. And you have to be cautious about that because one of the, the convent, part of the convention is that you have to use only the lowercase letters after, after V. W, X, Y, and Z as variables and the ones before are, are um, names that you can use. But be, be cautious about that. Okay. Uh, after line two, what's the next step? Uh, Kimberly, keep up with that. Uh, line two and elimination. Mm hmm. Okay. okay. And then line four, three, upside down A instruction. 
absolutely right. A Y is what we want, except that we, yeah, what we're looking for, we could have done X, but what we're looking for is A Y B Y, so that's what we get here. And it doesn't matter, even though you started out with X, it just says it's just a variable. So you just, you, once you cleared that, you can go back into W. Yeah. Is there really a way to change the variable so we could just do one change it to upside down A Y, A Y? No rule like that because it's so simple to do. There's no rule like that. that, you can just do that. No, you, you have to do something, you know, like if you wanted to prove A, Y, you know, all Y, A, Y, and B, Y, you'd have to go through a song and dance. But it probably wouldn't be a problem that would, you know, it wouldn't be a problem that would come up in real life if you ever were using quantification to, you know, try and symbolize a line of reasoning. And I don't think he's going to, I know he's not going to throw any problems like that to you anymore. Those were problems earlier when he was trying to demonstrate, you know, various demonstration techniques. But no, there's no rule that says that you can simply substitute. But you know, you can. You can just write, I mean, you could just write all y, all x, ax, and bx using any variable at all. In a proof, though, you have to be more cautious because you might have those other variables being used elsewhere in the, in the proof. I mean, in this particular example, there's only one variable that appears anywhere, so it can be anything. But in another proof, you might have another line that has Y or W or Z or something else, and you can't just interchange variables for that reason, I think. Okay, any questions? I want to at least do one uh, that illustrates um, existential elimination. Let's go with that one. Okay, this starts you with an existential premise. It wants you to come up with another one. Okay, Russ, do you have some thoughts about what to do on line one? Or the two, I mean? Okay, we don't say that yet. That's going to be the way that we draw our, matter of fact, it'll be down here someplace. We'll have EE will be the last line, wherever the last line is, okay? But you're right, we want to start one. How do we do that? Well, what, did, where, did you start a subderivation? No. Okay. No, you can't. Uh, this is, uh, existential elimination is a fairly complicated process because uh, while you know that something is both T and L, you don't know, for example, that A is. You don't know what is. Okay. So you can. What you can do is you can say, okay, let's just call it A, all right? But you're going to have to discharge that assumption that it's A in particular that has T, A, T, X, T and L. You have to discharge that assumption before coming back. Because you can't know, it doesn't tell you which, which of the many uh, members of the dom domain have T and L. It just says that one or some do, at least one does. It doesn't tell you which one it is. So you can't assume of any of the particular items in the domain that it's T or, I mean, you can't conclude that anyway. You can say, all right, look, I don't know which ones are T and L. I don't know which ones this line is referring to. I just know that some are. So let me just take as an illustrative example one of those. Let's just say it's A, okay? 
And when you, go, when you do that in a normal argument or a, nor, or a normal uh, discussion with somebody, you're not committed to its being A. You're just saying, all right, look, let's just take an example. Let's take an arbitrary uh, object that has both the property T and L. Some do, so let's just take one for example. I don't know which one it is. And so that, and then you have to give it a name to work with it. So you give it the name A or B or C, or you give it some name. But you gotta do it over here, because it's conditional. All right, so having said all that, I'll write, is this what you wrote on line two though? I mean, something like of that form? Yeah. Okay. The way it has to go in is as an assumption. Okay? You have to assume it. You can't just write it into the derivation. And, you, and so the, when you assume it, you don't have to give it any kind of a just, justification. You're just saying, I'm assuming it. Okay. All right. Looks like the way you're responding is, oh, you understood that part. And, but, so where would we go from here then? Yeah. Okay. Next. That's fine. That's good. So, so if, see, we've chosen some arbitrary member of the class of things that this applies to. We've chosen that as our name. We know that something does this. And so we're just saying, all right, one of them. <laughs> Let's talk about one of them. We don't know which one. We derive this from that. This is a very simple derivation, a very simple exercise, but you know, it, shows the, it shows the principles that are used in this derivation quite well, I think. And then we do exactly what you did. We, in the de subderivation, we do an existential instantiation, because since we've, we know that there's something that has those properties mentioned in one, and we've chosen this as an arbitrary example, so that we know that there's something we don't know which one. We don't know anything about A in particular, but because that was just the name that we gave to the to, to an example. We know what are we trying to do? Y. We can use choose Y as our variable. T Y, right? And that's what you did, correct? So by from three, we could assume that since A, you know, if it were true that A did that, then we would be allowed to to conclude that E Y T Y. And then that allows us. I've done it way down here, from one, which was the existential, uh, existentially quantified statement we unpacked, and two through four, which was the subderivation, we use uh, existential elimination, and we get the very same thing that was up there. So once again, I repeat what I said before. In existential eliminations, you're always simply moving this line, the previous line that you got to, into your main derivation, or at least into one that's closer to the main derivation. You might be working way out there, but you bring it back into the next closer uh, derivation line. And it always assumes a legitimate uh, substitution instance of, uh, of the existential formula that you're using. And by legitimate it's, or appropriate, uh, whatever the word that you might choose is, uh, it's one that hasn't been used before because it's just supposed to be an arbitrary example of one of these things that this says is true. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, done for today. <laughs>